go again. Hi, everybody. Welcome across all five Northway campuses. Good to see you at the start of our Bridge the Gap series. You know, if you think about it, we live in some pretty interesting times, don't we? I mean, it's not hard to imagine that politically, socially, economically, technologically. There's a lot of things that make today interesting. But there's one factor that often goes sort of overlooked when it comes to the days in which we live, and it's the generations that live today. See, I don't know if we realize this, but right now, where we live, where we work, where we play, in all walks and areas of life, there are six living generations on earth right now. Six different generations. First time ever in the history of humanity, we are living longer. And that means the generational melting pot in America today and in the world has extra ingredients more than ever before. Check this out. Look at this chart. These are the six different generations living and breathing and working all where we go, where we live, work, and play. Now, if you're anything like me, your eyes are naturally drawn, drawn to your own generation, aren't they? You found your birth date and you start to look just at your generation. It's kind of like when you're tagged in a picture on social media, right? You're in a group photo and you look directly at yourself. There's a kindergarten picture of me circulating around the internet. And every time I look at it, I look at myself and I think, mom, why did you cut my hair like that? Why did you put a striped shirt on me? No one else had striped shirts, right? But in this series, I'm going to challenge us to look a little bit differently, to look beyond our lane and take a gaze into the generations next to us. So let me ask a question. How do you think about your neighboring generations? And let me be more specific. When I say the word millennial, what comes to your mind? You know, this clashing of generations is especially challenging when a generation rises up into their 20s and 30s because they're no longer held by the walls and halls of our schools. They're now in the workforce. They're out in the community. They're stepping into roles in our schools, and we are mixing and matching with them and trying to figure out this new dance with a whole new group of people who think differently than us, who have a different outlook and a perspective and different sort of sets of values than we do. This is going on right now on our staff. I don't know if you realize this. We have a, a pretty wide age range of folks on our staff team. And so what I thought we would do to get after this idea of generational gaps and the challenge when a new generation starts to emerge into the, to the mix of generations in the workplace, I wanted to invite them up to get their thoughts and their take on what the generational gaps we face right here on our staff as a Northway team. So before I invite them up on stage, why don't you join with me? Let's check out the screens so we can get to know them just a bit. Let's check this out. Hello everyone, my name is Scott McCabe and I'm the campus pastor of our Swickley Valley campus. I've been on the staff here at Northway since 1985 and for those doing the math, you're right. I'm considered a boomer. Hi, I'm Amanda Biggs. I'm 32 years old and I've been on staff at Northway for 10 years and I'm the Director of Leadership Development. Being born in 1984, by definition, I'm a millennial, but at times, I'm more closely aligned with Generation X. Hello, my name is Vince Giordano. I'm the Student Ministry Director at Northway Wexford, and I've been on staff for about five years now. I was born in 1990, which may be a surprise to many of you because of the serious touch of gray going on upstairs, and I am 100% millennial. As a boomer, I tend to see this world with positivity. The glass is always half full and very characteristic with this generation. I'm goal-oriented, resourceful, and creative. Also, like a boomer, I love to work. Since the day I graduated from high school, I've been employed somewhere. I guess you could say that job security is extremely important to me and to my generation. So being a millennial, I'd say what's true for me is, is that I can tend to get caught up in the fulfillment of my job. I mean, I, I dream about doing things of great significance and making a huge impact on our world. I'm sure a lot of it comes from my obsession with Lord of the Rings or comic book movies where there's always a hero with some epic story of significance. But, you know, finding financial security, it isn't as important to me as doing something I find great value in. Though some cash would be nice as well. As someone who connects between two different generational labels, I can remember life before technology ruled our day. We called our first cell phone a car phone, and it was gigantic. In college, my mom still called my dorm room phone. Facebook just started, and Apple was introducing the iPod. Living through all this change, I grew up believing that I could change the world, and I'm thankful for that. I identify with millennials on the deep desire to make a difference. I want to do work that matters. 
At the same time, like a Generation Xer, I've loved spending this last decade at Northway because I've seen the strength and longevity and the value of hard work over the long haul. I think my go-to app on the phone is Waze, if that's how you say it. I do kind of like knowing when the police officers are around the corner. I don't know, maybe the Starbucks mobile order? At first, I think of the news. I'm always clicking through the news and just trying to be updated on stuff. And then kind of like my secret, you know, is Clash Royale, Clash Clans kind of stuff. I like to play games. Come on, I'm a millennial. I know all about that Xbox. It's got to be the Insta, the Gram, Instagram, for those of you who aren't familiar with the lingo of millennials. Instagram. What's a social media platform? <laughs> 17. Ooh, you remember that one. That like, one, my God, I remember that. my blue Nokia, awesome little square phone. My first cell phone was a car phone, and it was about the size of a toaster. Uh, so <laughs> I was probably in my 40s. I was 16, freshman year, high school. Um, parents didn't allow me to have a cell phone till freshman year of high school. Surprise, elementary school kids and middle school kids. Hey guys, thanks, uh, thanks for being here. Had fun with the video, getting to know you a little bit. And uh, I thought it'd be good as we, as we start to get under the hood of generational gaps, hear their perspective and hear their words, folks from different generations. And as I've been on staff here now for a little over a year, um, you three are folks that came to my mind instantly as I was trying to figure out who could speak to this issue because I've learned so much from the three of you um, in just a short amount of time. Scott, I've seen you um, bridge generational gaps and get your point across without having to be someone that talks all the time or stands up and speaks the loudest. You do it with such grace um, and passion. And Amanda, I've seen you, um, I've learned from you, value details and see the big picture and communicate that to generations above you and generations below you with eloquence and it's awesome to watch. And Vince, my man, I've seen you not be driven by personal ambition. You're someone who leads in student ministries and deeply desires to make a difference to the generation you lead, and it's not a selfish, driven desire. It's, it's really pure-hearted. And so I thought hearing from you guys would help us all understand generational gaps. And so my very first question, Scott, we'll start with you, is when it comes to your generation, you said you're a boomer. I'm sure that some myths abound. There's some misunderstandings or myths about your, your generation. Can you talk about that? Tell us, tell us a myth about your boomer generation. Yeah, that's kind, of a, that's kind of a softball question, Dave, uh, to me, anyway, <laughs> because we're known as the me generation. And I got I to gotta tell you, I, I think we are anything but the me generation. The people I know uh, are some of the, the, the kindest, most generous people, especially uh, folks in my generation, taking care of their parents, the greatest generation in some cases, as well as uh, their offspring, not unlike the ages of my peers here. So I think that's really quite a myth that that's we would be called the, the, the me generation. Yeah, absolutely. Amanda, how about you and your generation? Yeah, I think the biggest myth surrounding our generation is that we're that wildly different from other generations. I mean, sure, there's circumstances that definitely make us unique, but somehow we've all bought into this idea that we're the first ones to grow up among technological advancement or political turmoil or with parents who made a few mistakes. And really, I think a lot of the labels that are placed on us, like narcissism or pushing social norms or loving social justice, could really be true of all generations in their 20s and 30s. I mean, I'm sure Scott could tell us some great stories from the 70s. So I think we're making a bigger deal out of it than we really need to. Maybe even from the 60s, right, Scott? <laughs> stories across the board, yeah. Vince, how about you? How about myths from your generation? Yeah, so immediately when I think the first word that comes to mind when people think of millennials is entitled. And um, though there may be entitled tendencies with people, you know, late teens, mid 20s, um, I know that I personally was raised uh, by a family who taught me to work hard, that things won't necessarily come easy, that um, you're to be grateful and, and humble um, each and every day. So um, I think sometimes the label of millennial and entitlement can get a little bit too definitive. Mm, yeah, that's good. That's good. So you guys are working and, you're, and you have people older than you, younger than you. Um, interacting with them, leading them, building teams among them, and there's these myths out there, misunderstandings or labels about you. So my question is this. Next, um, Amanda, we'll start with you. How do you wish people would see you? If you had an ideal world and the labels were gone, how do you want to be seen? 
I think instead of being, you know, given the label that I have to do things my way or that I'm entitled, that I would be characterized as someone who always takes a posture of humility, willing to learn from the generations before me and the generations below me. That's good. Vince, how about you? From the millennials? Yeah, definitely rather um, than entitled. Um, how about grateful? I'd love to be remembered as grateful, um, to love God and, and love others. So. Yeah, that's really, really good. And Scott, how do you want to be seen? How do you want people to look at Pastor Scott McCabe? If I had a magic wand, I wish they would just flip this thing upside down instead of seeing me as a part of the me generation, see me as a part of the we generation. I, yeah, I have my own self-interest, and I, I, I know that, but I genuinely care about the interests of others as well on both sides, generationally. Absolutely, and I think the people who attend our Swickley Valley campus certainly feel that from you as you pass through there. Um, so last question is this. We have myths about us. We have a way that we want to be seen. And I know everyone listening at all of our campuses, you have a way you want to be seen as well. Um, generational labels. Amanda, we'll, we'll start with you. Helpful or harmful and why? Definitely harmful. I think labels just make it really easy for us to build walls and be divided when really we're called to be united. That's good. Vince, how about you? Helpful, harmful, why? Yeah, definitely, definitely harmful. Um, labels limit you. They put you in a box, and rather than, um, you know, understanding one another, you label one another, and it, and it hurts. So. Yeah. Scott, Landon with you? We're going to make it unanimous. Uh, labels are harmful. Uh, labels diminish, I think. They diminish people. Uh, God wants us to build one another up. Uh, labels divide. God wants us to be united. That's really good. Hey, I appreciate you guys. You guys have demonstrated a lot when it comes to working across generations to me and I'm sure we all appreciate you giving us some of your time to answer a couple of quick questions so can we give them a hand and thank them um, tonight today hey so check this out as I was doing my research and I was trying to understand all six different generations I found a website that did a really nice job of articulating differences among all six generations and what they did is they showed a picture as well they gave us an image to attach every generation to. And so when you look back at the GI generation, the oldest generation on earth, here's the image associated with them. It's the planting of the flag on Iwo Jima. It's an iconic moment for that generation. The silent generation that followed him, the ones that were born into the Great Depression, if you remember that at the early 1930s, the image that represented them was Black Tuesday, the crash on, of Wall Street, right? And everybody going there to figure out what happened. And then the boomer generation, the moment that sort of represents them and, and allows us to remember who they were, it's a protest moment. It's protesting Vietnam War at the White House, having their voice be heard. For my generation, Generation X, it's the fall of the Berlin Wall. You remember that? The end of the Cold War, really, really big moment. And then check this out. This is the image chosen for the millennial generation. two ladies taking a selfie. And then for our kids who are in kids' church, Generation Z, the boomlets, it's two kids on an iPad. Why do we do that sort of stuff? Why for the millennials do we choose an image of two people taking a selfie when it could have been an image of the terror attacks of 9-11? Why do we do that? Why for Generation Z, my kids, your kids, why do we choose two kids, you know, they can't get their eyes off the iPad when what they've been living through is constant war in the Middle East? Why do we do that to them? See, there's a phenomenon called generational typecasting that we're living through right now. Generational typecasting is what we're doing to groups and groups of people. You've heard of the term typecasting, I'm sure, right? From actors in the movies. It's when someone plays a certain role, a particular character or role, and then for the rest of their career, we define them or associate them with that role. No matter how many other roles or movies they played, we always think of them as one single thing. Think about Morgan Freeman, right? Morgan Freeman is the voice of wisdom, right? He's the wise old sage. I mean, goodness, he even played God in the Bruce Almighty movies, right? He's typecast into that kind of role. We're doing the same thing with generations. We're making early observations. We're applying them broadly to about 20 years worth of people and we're making sure they stick by never going back and editing them. And we're in a rush to be first to label them. It's 
generational typecasting. Now, I don't know if you know this or not, but in the academic world, at the university level, a lot of scholarly folks are actually starting to shy away from using the generational terms that we so often use to describe people. Think about it. We are labeling people way too early. Did you know that we label a generation before half of them even hit 10 years old? They haven't even hit puberty yet, and we have the chart filled out on them. We know who they are and how they're going to act and what they're going to value, and they're not even 10. We're in a rush to be first to label them, and we publish quickly. And what sticks out of everything that we publish? The negative stuff, doesn't it? I mean, goodness, that's what, that's what people will click on when they're on the Internet. That's what will sell negative, you know, newspapers, negative news. And the worst thing about it all is we're using sloppy research message, methods to come to our conclusions. All we're using to fill out our charts and to figure out who millennials are and who boomlets are are opinions gathered from surveys, not research, not studied over a period of time, opinions and research. See, I think we're jumping to conclusions way too quickly about a whole bunch of people. And I think it's leading us down a path that's really not worth following. I mean, think about it. When I say the word millennial, what comes to your mind? Entitled? Lazy? Addicted to social media or their cell phone? Yeah, that's the stuff that's out there. That's the stuff that gets published so much. And rarely, if ever, do we hear how generous they are. But research shows us they're the first to give when there's a need. Rarely do we ever hear that this generation of millennials right now in their 20s and 30s, that they are deeply interested in making a difference to causes that matter. And they're more interested in making a difference than turning a quick buck. But we don't hear that story, do we? We just hear the negative over and over again. I mean, if you could, if you're, if you're not a millennial, could you put yourself in their shoes for just a moment? Imagine sitting down to an interview across the table from a couple of folks from a generation ahead of you, maybe two generations ahead of you, and you know going into that moment that their starting viewpoint of you is that you're lazy. The perception that they've been fed about you is that you're entitled and that in every single meeting you're going to think you should get your way. And oh, by the way, every two minutes when you have a break, you're going to be out on your phone checking Instagram. Imagine that uphill battle. What's it going to be like if you do get the job? Is it going to be one team, one dream, happy, like parties after work and everybody gets together? Or is it going to be two different sections of the office divided by gaps filled with mistrust? What's it going to be? I don't think generational labels are serving us the way that they were intended to serve us. I mean, when will we realize that every generation needs a chance to just grow up, to figure out their path, to find out how to respond to the context that they're maturing through, the political scene, the social scene, the technological advancements that they have? I mean, think about it. We've all had our moment to express ourselves. Rock and roll, protests, Woodstock, MTV, social media, we all have our own way of figuring out how to grow up. And yet we are so deeply disturbed by the next generation as they're hitting their stride and making their way into adulthood. I don't understand why it bothers us so much. I mean, after all, aren't they simply responding to the world we created and handed to them? Think about it. These generational labels, all they're doing is building walls. All they're doing is dividing us about every 20 years, and they're keeping us from being who we really could be. They're limiting our potential. They're limiting our perspective. If you ask me, as I do the research and as I study and I look into this stuff and I figure out what's going on with these generational gaps, all I land on is this simple truth that generational labels, they build walls, not bridges, and they're hurting us over and over and over again. I can't imagine the hurdles my kids are going to have to overcome when they hit their 20s, when they hit their 30s. But what if we were to think differently? What if we were to start to sort of tear down the walls and start to build bridges? What, what if we were to take all the division and start to just look at it differently and begin to be one? What could happen? 
See, the more divided we live, the less fulfilled we will be. You know, when I look in the scriptures, in the times that, that the Bible was written, this idea of different people groups not meshing real well together, it's not a new concept. These different divides and gaps between people groups, it's not brand new. It goes back all the way to the beginning of time. If you check out the book of Galatians, when Paul wrote that letter to the early churches in the Roman province of Galatia, he was addressing this very type of issue. You see, going on right then at that point in the early days of the church, the church was growing and they were expanding, but there was a clash. There were the Jewish folks who grew up with the law. They had a deep respect for what Moses taught them and, and passed on to them. And they were becoming followers of Jesus, but they were still holding on to this law piece. And their political perspective and religious perspective and social perspective was, if you don't have the law, you can't be a part of God's kingdom. And at the same time, as they're growing in this province of Galatia, here were folks who weren't Jews. We call them Gentiles, right? They were growing up and they were starting to follow this guy named Jesus too. But they didn't respect the law the same way. They had a different outlook. They had a different value system. They sort of went about life their way, not the Jewish way. And this divide was tearing the church apart. The church was being limited by gaps between people. And that's why Paul wrote this letter. And the intent and design of this letter was to be circulated to all the churches. Here's what he says when he writes in Galatians to this group of people so they can figure out how to work and how to build bridges and not walls. Galatians 3, verse 26 through 28, he says this, so in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. You all got in the same way. You're all together. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor there is there male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. There's no labels in Christ. For those of us who are followers of Jesus Christ, there's not supposed to be a divide. We're meant and designed to function as one. Paul was saying building bridges is way more important and valuable than building walls between us. He was saying if you're in Christ in a modern day translation, there is no boomer. There is no generation X. There's no need for Generation Z, the boomlets. There is no need for millennials. We are all one in Christ. What Paul was saying, if we as the church can begin to see each other the way God sees us, imagine what could happen. Imagine the power of unity. You know, it's interesting. When you try to figure out from Scripture how God does see us, it's pretty clear. He doesn't see labels. He sees his creation. He sees us as one, his people, who he loves. Psalms 33, it says this, from heaven, the Lord looks down and sees all mankind. That phrase right there, all mankind, it refers to the whole of us. It means one vantage point God has of all of us is that we are just his people, his creation. He sees the whole of us all at once. It goes on, from his dwelling place, he watches all who live on earth. He who forms the heart of all, who considers everything they do. That part right there is just a little bit of a different translation on how God sees us. He sees everything we do. So not only does God see the whole of us as one, his people whom he loves and he created, he sees our uniqueness too. He sees every single thing we do. He formed our hearts individually with his image God sees the big picture and he sees the unique individual identity he put on our hearts. But he doesn't see labels. He doesn't break us up into 20-year chunks and fit us onto some spreadsheet with characteristics and values and preferences of communication because he loves us too much to do that. You see, when we use labels to separate people, Maybe we're denying the God-given uniqueness that he created us with. Maybe we're doing more harm than good. You know, before Jesus went to the cross, this idea of oneness was pretty important to him. In John 17, his longest prayer to the Father is recorded. 
And Jesus, you know, I, I think of it like this. He went through sections in this prayer, and one of the sections was, was dedicated about us, his followers, those that would be after his disciples. And what Jesus talks about in this prayer is so important for the generational gaps and the divide that we're trying to bridge today with six generations living on this earth. And I think about it like this. Jesus had this as a purpose of the cross. This is the kind of thing that, that allowed him to push through the agony of that type of a death, that type of a suffering. It was the hope and promise that we could be united. He prayed for us that we wouldn't let walls divide us. That things like millennial and generation X and boomer and silent generation and boomlet and all the other terms that we have, that they wouldn't become things that distract his church and move us off mission. John 17 verse 20 says this, my prayer is not for them alone. Talking about the disciples. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message. That's us. That all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I've given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one, I in them and you in me, so that they may be brought to complete unity. He gave us his glory so we could be together, not apart. Then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. See, Jesus had his, us on his mind when he went to that cross. And he gave us his power and his glory so that we could show the world who he is. But when we use terms to separate, terms to stereotype, terms to limit, terms to prejudge so we don't have to take time to get to know, the world does not see Jesus. But when we build bridges, when we allow his grace and his patience and his understanding, and his kindness, and his long-suffering to be on display through us by the way we cross generational gaps, the world somehow, someway sees him. They see a unified church displaying his glory. You know, we sing a song here at Northway all the time pleading for God to show us his glory. And many times, simple obedience of unity is how the world will see his glory. It doesn't always have to be a miracle, though I'd love to see miracles. It doesn't always have to be something supernatural so that the world can say, wow, the glory of God is on display. No, it can be obedience in our relationship to tear down walls and cross generational gaps and begin to understand and not label one another. Not be divided by what the charts and the so-called research says about us. You know, unity speaks, doesn't it? Unity is really, really powerful. I thought about it just recently when the Pens won the Stanley Cup. One of my favorite things to do when they win the Stanley Cup, and it feels like I get to do this a lot, right? Because they win a lot. I love when they get the tradition of having the cup and passing it around to the team. I stay up, I watch that because it's so cool just to see that tradition in motion. And the captain starts with the cup, and then they pass it around. And did you see the moment when goalie to goalie happened? When Marc-Andre Fleury, the, the goalie who is no longer a penguin anymore, he lost his job to Matt Murray when he chose and had a choice on who to pass the cup to, he passed it to Matt Murray. Do you remember that moment? The whole sports world took notice. Because unity catches our attention. You know, the media in terms of sports, they love to cover scandal. They love to cover controversy. They love to cover, you know, suspensions and fights and all that stuff. But for a moment, because of this display of unity, they stopped and they changed the narrative. They talked about what it's like for one older generation to come across to another and how powerful and humbling and great of a person Marc-Andre Fleury was. And that's just in sports. Could you imagine if the church rose up and did that in our school system? in our communities, right here in our church building? Could you imagine what the world would see if we would bridge, not build walls? The world would see Jesus. Because unity speaks. 
See, our job as followers of Christ, it's to give the whole world a preview of the coming attraction called heaven. And we do so when we live in unity. We give the world a preview of what heaven is going to be like. Our job and our call is to build bridges, not walls. I have a good friend who has um, sort of stood the test of time in ministry. He's spent over 30 years pastoring um, out in Ohio and in California, and never once was he the lead pastor. And over the course of 30 years, as he has grown, he has been led by people older than him, and he's been led by people who are younger than him. He's interfaced with millennials and Generation X and Boomer Generation and the Greatest Generation. He has seen it and done it all. And through the years, I have seen this person who has mentored me and shaped my life and my faith. I have seen him build more bridges than anyone else in my life. And if you talk to anyone about my friend and you ask them what they think about him, ask somebody young in their 20s, ask someone in their 40s, and maybe someone in their 70s, every single person without thinking about it, they say, man, he's such a great dude to work with. Because he builds bridges. And as I got to spend about 10 years working with him, I took some notes. And I saw in action what it means and what it looks like to build bridges and not walls. So I want to give us a couple of thoughts about what to do and how to respond if we really want to aim our hearts and our lives as a church to be bridge builders. The first thing is this. Bridge builders, they don't use labels to describe people, ever. They avoid the the tendency to stereotype groups of people with labels. They don't limit a person's potential by a label. You know why bridge builders don't use labels? Because they know people's first names. They know them personally, and they're willing to get close and get to know, and despite anything that doesn't feel right or isn't normal or isn't what they prefer, they keep getting closer and closer and building more and more of a bridge to get to know their uniqueness that God created them, rather than seeing them through the label that our culture has given them. Bridge builders don't use labels because it's worth it. The second thing I've seen my friend do really, really well across time as he has worked with generation upon generation, it's this idea that bridge builders are deeply convinced that they still have something to learn from anyone. You see, the moment we think we know it all is the moment we've put a wall up. You know, there's a difference between, you know, being convinced about something and being certain about something. The moment I meet someone who is so certain that they know this, you really can't talk to that person. Their mind is already made up. The walls are built, and they're going to do what they're going to do. But bridge builders aren't like that. Bridge builders know that every generation around them has something that they do not. It's called perspective. That younger generation and generation above them and way above them sees what they do not because all of us have blind spots in life. And the person that sees our blind spot is usually from a different generation because they have responded to a different set of contexts and cultural artifacts that we had to respond to in our 20s and 30s and 40s. Perspective isn't always gained through experience. Sometimes it comes through passion. Sometimes perspective comes through dreaming big and being a little bit idealistic. Bridge builders never close off their ear. They always keep listening, and they're deeply convinced that they can learn at least something. The third thing I saw my good friend do, and he did this one exceptionally well, it's this idea that bridge builders are not easily offended. If you see a bridge builder at the airport, they didn't check any baggage. They're traveling light. Because they know that picking up offenses at every little thing that they do not prefer is only going to slow them down. Bridge builders don't take everything personally. They understand that we all have in our minds a way that people should act, a way that that our boss should be or our spouse or our kids should respond, but we realize humbly that they all don't. And we keep our eyes fixed, bridge builders do, on what could be, not on what we think should be. And we don't dare pick up an offense because all the offense does is drags our heart down, not theirs. Bridge builders travel really, really light. It says in Proverbs, 
that the righteous, meaning those whose hearts are rightly aligned with God's, avoid all extremes. You know what an extreme is? It's an extreme to always pick up an offense. To always take things personally. So my final question is this. Are you willing to be a bridge builder? Are you willing to see the generations above you, below you, right next to you, the way God sees us? Are you willing to live differently and build bridges, not walls? I think it's worth it. I think because when we live united, we get to experience all God had designed for us as his church. I hope you'll join me in this effort in building bridges across generational gaps. At this moment, across all of our campuses, I'm gonna ask your campus leaders to join on stage and close our time together.